Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. The hall is buzzing with excitement at the forthcoming debate. Um, my name is Nick Westcott. I'm the director of the Royal African Society. It is uh, our enormous honour and privilege to welcome the Tutu Fellows to SOAS. So give yourselves a round. And also our audience, thank you very much for coming to listen also to the Tutu Fellows. Um, I had the great fortune to meet the Tutu Fellows uh, last week, I think it was, time flies, um, to listen to their presentations of projects uh, when they had arrived back in Oxford for the final term of their uh, fellowships. And I have to say, I was bowled away by the uh, effort and energy that everybody had put in. So I know already that this group of Tutu Fellows are opinionated, articulate, and forthright in the way they present their case. So I'm anticipating a very lively and enjoyable debate. The Royal African Society exists to uh, amplify and provide a platform for African voices. And there are no better, more interesting voices than those of the Tutu Fellows all of whom have already been active in life and are just uh, you know, well beyond the student stage and have a huge amount to contribute, as I heard last week, and will contribute to this debate. So uh, a more interesting group of African voices to provide a platform for, I imagine. <coughs> I am eagerly looking forward to it. You have decided to tackle some of the critical topics in contemporary African affairs, uh, and I am really just going to get off the stage, hand over to Jackie, who will introduce uh, speakers and moderators. Uh, and uh, just uh, from my point of view, from SOAS, the Royal African Society, a very warm welcome. And we look forward to remaining closely associated wherever you may end up with the Royal African Society, as we are increasing, increasingly with the onset of Zoom and global communications, a global organization, not just a British one. So thank you all very much for coming. And Jackie, over to you. Good evening, everyone. You're not to answer. Good I won't bite, I promise. Yeah, but thank you so much for making the time to be here with us tonight. Um, I'm a tutor fellow as well, so I'm brilliant. Um, <laughs> I'm a tutor fellow from 2010, and since 2016, I've been the CEO. This job for me is not just a job, it feels like a calling. Uh, I couldn't be more passionate about what I do. Uh, I feel like a mother to 400 children. <laughs> <laughs> the fellows, and half the time it's like herding cats. Uh, so we've developed, we've curated a network of 400 fellows over the years, since 2006. <coughs> this cohort from this, the ones that will be debating, they're actually from 2020, but because of the pandemic, the program was delayed. So it's been a long wait for them to actually finally complete the program. But they're a great group, they're immensely fun, and tomorrow they'll graduate as two fellows. Uh, so it'll be emotional because we will say our goodbyes tomorrow. But for tonight, uh, the debate will be mo moderated by four two fellows. Uh, we've got Lanri Akinola, he's the editor of uh, Numara, and he's the former editor of This is Africa, the Financial Times of African Business. Uh, we've got Dr. Debisi Araba, who's currently with the Imperial College in London. He's a climate change expert and agriculture expert. We've got Ronak Gopaldas from South Africa. He's the director of Signal Risk. He's also an academic. Uh, and then we've got Dr. Rob Tell, Niaji Paley. She's also 20, 2010 Tutu Fellow. She was in my class. <laughs> We're very self promotional. As we see um, yeah, she's a librarian. She's an academic. She's an activist. And she's just brilliant. And the four panels that they'll be moderating are as follows. Um, the first one is on entrepreneurship, and that will see Teresa Mbagaya from Kenya. She's the founding principal of Imaginable Futures, which is part of the Omedia group. She will be going head to head with Kola Aina. He's the investor founding partner of Ventures Platform. So he's a venture capitalist from Nigeria. The second debate we will see will be about climate change, and that will see. So 
And that will see Natalie Forti from Zimbabwe. This will be very interesting. So Natalie is actually an agricultural business practitioner. So very interesting to hear the views of a young African woman who's actually in agriculture on a very large scale and to hear her passion for the effects of climate change, but more importantly, what she thinks the West should be doing to help Africa. She will go head to head with Sheni Suleiman from Nigeria. Sheni is the founder of Black Ops. So Sheni has got a very can-do attitude. He's just to set up businesses and make them work. So he doesn't really see the constraints of climate change. But he's like, Africa just needs to get on with it. So that's going to be a very interesting one. And then we have Africa in the New Global Order, which will be moderated by Ronak. In that particular debate, we've got two interesting views. We have Maimuna from Guinea, uh, who will be arguing that Africans need to be loyal to their to the alliances of their past. So must Africa remain loyal to Russia because Russia helped liberate a lot of Africa? And she'll be going head to head with Dr. Mayu Patel, who will be arguing that Africa needs to forge new alliances in the global order. Then finally, we've got one on leadership slash corruption. In that one, we will see Saif from Egypt, who will be arguing against um, so Saif will be up against okay, okay, okay. So Saif will be up against um, will be with Boniface Mwangi. I don't know how many of you know Boniface Mwangi. He's a bit of a celebrity. He's been arrested multiple times. He's been in jail. He's an activist, uh, and really his whole life he's been arguing and crusading against corruption in Africa. So that will be a very interesting one. And they will be up against Diaka Kamara and Dalimuzi Mklanga from Guinea and Zimbabwe, who argue that Africa is no more corrupt than other parts of the world, but Africa just gets very bad publicity. So I look forward to the debates, and I hope you enjoy them. Then we'll open up with a, a Q&A so that you can engage the positions that they take. So as they come up, they'll each present their position for about four or five minutes, and then we we'll open up to take your views. Thank you. Thank you. All right, where are my presenters? Good evening. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. Thanks, Jackie. Great to see you all. Um, always a pleasure to be with the two two fellows. Okay. Uh, time is of the essence here. We have 20 minutes for this session. Uh, the speakers have five minutes each to make their case, after which we're going to have 10 minutes to have some quick fire questions. I'm not going to mess around with time tonight, okay? So if I, when I say quick questions, I mean quick questions. And if you don't give me a quick question, I will cut you off. End of story. Same goes for the speakers. You have five minutes. I will give you a two-minute warning, a one-minute warning, and then you're going to be out of time. Um, I don't think this, this was expressly clear, but the basic argument here is that uh, entrepreneurship or successful entrepreneurship is about policies and government, sorry, versus it's not about that, it's about, it's about culture and it's about having the right mental attitude, basically. Okay, without further ado, uh, let's get right into it. Teresa, you are first. Let's hear your take on what makes entrepreneurship work. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Brilliant. When we talk about entrepreneurship in Africa, what we're ultimately talking about is survival entrepreneurship. We're asking young people who are doing without to put more risk in order to start and continue businesses. We ask them to do this in spite of broken systems that shackle them to vicious cycles of poverty. In spite of colonial education systems that ultimately serve as filtration tools, saying you can go forward and you cannot in spite of increasing youth unemployment across Africa. And still time and time again, we ask for their resilience. We pride them on being resilient young Africans and we should be ashamed. We applaud them for their survival when as governments through our policies, we should be enabling the lives of not just our young, but our citizens to thrive. It is said often that when we talk about new business growth or new employment in Africa, what we're ultimately talking about is SMSCs and the role of small and medium-sized businesses, and especially those in the informal sector. And yet, 
we know that in order for these businesses to grow, for our economies and young people to thrive, we not only, we cannot do it without government. Many of you may have heard the terms shared over and over again from Oreo Colo that essentially says, we cannot, we cannot entrepreneur a way out of bad policies. And yet we need these catalytic businesses. And so when I think about the role of entrepreneurship in Africa and the role of government particularly, one of the first things that we need to do is understand that we are siphoning money away from young businesses into the pockets of the few. $300 billion annually are taken through corruption into the pockets of the few. And yet many young businesses, many young entrepreneurs are asking for more capital. We also talk about education systems, how we need more skilled labor, the role of Zoom. And yet we are not addressing this debate in these spaces. We know that less than 10% of our, our African youth enter into higher education. We know that it will take 100 years for children in developing countries, such as many that we come from, to reach the education levels of those in the development countries. We do not have the time. Our governments need to be taking more action. We know, for instance, we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, and yet only 43% of our continent is electrified. We are creating more policies that make it difficult for young people to create businesses. And then we go back and applaud them and tell them, thank you for being resilient. Again, we should be ashamed. In order to create more jobs, in order to create dignity, in order to ensure that we have not just economic growth, but the thriving of our societies, we need to ensure that we have the right policies that enable us to go from SMSEs to medium and large businesses. We need to add dignity to those who are operating in the informal sector, understanding that they are the drivers of Africa's economy. And so again, we cannot ask our young to continue to be resilient, to tell them job well done, when those we know that those startups, those organizations that succeed, it's just, nine, it's just less than 5%. And so why are we here today? It is not to debate this question because we already know the answer. It is rather to say, how do we build the better policies to ensure that our economies thrive, that our young people have dignity, that we do not tell young people time and time again, just go out there and be resilient. Thank you. You got 60 seconds left. <laughs> All right, well done, well done. Right, of course. Okay, I guess that means you have six minutes. Huh? All right. Uh, ready, set, go. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My colleague Teresa has just made a very brilliant, convincing case for the role of policy, government, and regulation in building thriving entrepreneurial ecosystems on the continent. Now, why I, like anyone in this audience, believes governments have a critical role to play I wouldn't hold my breath. Most of you here come from countries in Africa where we depend on governments. We hope governments would sit tight and reform policy, but they don't. In the last three years, African countries from Egypt to Nigeria to South Africa are leading in entrepreneurial growth. This is in spite of governments. Take the case of Lagos, for instance. Lagos, over the last three years, has produced three unicorns founded by young Africans, mostly educated in Nigerian schools. Lagos has attracted one third of all venture capital in the continent. But if you are a young guy that works in any one of this, these startups in Lagos, you wear a jean, you have dreadlocks, and you have a MacBook with you. You're very likely to be arrested by the police. Yet again, I tell you, the progress young people are making in Africa is in spite of government. In Egypt, today you have one of the fastest growing entrepreneurial ecosystems powered by young people. But yet Egypt is led, led by military dictatorship. Over the last three years, across the continent, 
we have seen the acceleration of what some will call a decline of democracy. But in that same time, young Africans have raised three times the volume of venture capital that they raised in 2019. The reality is that the youth of Africa from Lagos to South Africa, to, 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 to Cape Town, to Nairobi, are not waiting on governments to, to set policy right. And so fundamentally, I believe that we can chew gum and dance at the same time. So why we wait on government to get their act right? Young people all over the continent need to think about how they innovate around the challenges that exist on the continent. After all, entrepreneurship at its core is about creating something from nothing. It's about doing more with less. This is the challenge we have as young people in Africa. Thank you. Okay, that was very to the point by both speakers, which is good. That leaves us some uh, more room for discussion and debate. Um, if you have questions, put up your hands and uh, I will invite you to contribute. But first, um, to pick up the conversation, uh, Teresa, very emotive, very, very compassionate uh, presentation from you. Uh, clearly, it's easier said than done if you're a young struggling African. But what one thing that I was curious about as you were speaking is what does the research say about this? Uh, because entrepreneurship isn't something that's only happening in Africa, it's happening in every part of the world. And some places are doing better than others. Are you able to give us a little bit of insight into why it's working in some places and not working in others and why that supports your side of the argument? Absolutely. Um, I'll call to maybe two data points. One, there's an organization that many of you may know called Endeavor, which gathers and supports um, catalytic organizations across the world. They're working in a number of countries. And time and time again, the research has shown that the organizations that truly transform economies are larger scale organizations. How do we get SMSEs to be catalytic growth drivers? We need to support them. And that is often driven by government policy. We at Imaginable Futures, prior um, known as Media Network, also con conducted a number of research around education systems, understanding what allows for education systems to thrive, particularly those that are also driven by um, utility of technology. We found that one of the biggest drivers was also government policies, how government engages with the private sector, how they create procurement policies in order to support these innovations, and essentially creating a marketplace for these organizations to thrive. Time and time again, we see that regardless of what a young person can do, regardless and in spite of what they can do within the systems that they operate in, if we do not have the grounding policies, they will not thrive to the level that we need to in order for our countries to thrive. When we talk about the role of exports, of moving across logistics across one country to the next, that is not simply the doings of one individual, one organization, one founder. That, in, that is an integration of policies across countries, policies within country. And so the research is quite clear. If we do not focus on ensuring that we have the right policies, the right government partnerships, the right tax structures within our societies, our entrepreneurs will remain startups and small and medium-sized enter, enter, enterprises. We cannot claim to applaud three unicorns in a country, in a continent that is as large as ours. Thank you, Theresa. Kola, back to you. You've given us some compelling examples of people who are defying, uh, defying the odds and uh, building successful, scalable companies despite of all these impediments. Um, convince us and convince me that those aren't just the exception to the rule. For every one of those unicorns, how many failed uh, startups are there and how many people are there that will never really have a realistic shot at uh, scaling up. So tell me why they are indicative of systemic progress. Um, I think the very essence of entrepreneurship is requires trying and, and sometimes failing. And so I think the failure rates of startups that you referenced and the fact that we only have three unicorns on the continent is reflective of progress. Now, 
there is evidence that suggests, uh, and if you reference books like The Prosperity Paradox written by Efusa Ojomo, there is evidence that suggests that as entrepreneurial ecosystems form, they get large enough that they can't start to influence uh, government policy, but from what I like to call a demand-driven perspective, a perspective that understands and is and draws insights from the entrepreneurial ecosystems themselves. And so I, I put it to you that these entrepreneurial ecosystems that are resilient and that are raising themselves up by their bootstraps are in fact a catalyst for government reform. Give me some examples of ecosystems like that that have bootstrapped their way up outside of Africa in countries where that are considered to be good places for entrepreneurship. It's the usual suspects, the US, Western Europe, some of the uh, Scandinavian countries. Um, what evidence is there that that was despite government policy? Well, look, I, I think that the African ecosystem is going to, uh, is going to develop in, a, in its own unique way. I'll go back to using Lagos as an example, right? Um, there, there was no deliberate plan by governments to, to build an ecosystem per se in Lagos. But today we have the beginnings of a vibrant entrepreneurship ecosystem. And I think that uh, you can start to see how, you know, building blocks start to come together, you know, as you have shining examples of success. At its core, entrepreneurs need inspiration. And so for every pay stack that, is successful or every you're, you're, you're dodging the question. <laughs> so Silicon Valley, for example, is in bootstrap. We all know that story, right? right the US right. military research, decades of it going into it. Anyway, Therese, I want to throw something something back to you. Uh, Colin made a, a very important observation at the start of his presentation, which is governments ain't gonna do it. There's no evidence that it's happening. When you look at the indices, when you look at the rankings, you look at the research reports on entrepreneurship, unfortunately, African countries are usually at the bottom of the pile. So um, are you expecting people to just sit around and wait for some sort of miracle? How do you change that picture? And uh, do entrepreneurs really have a choice? Do they have to defy the odds? Yeah, I think that's a great question that I'll also ask when we have all um, taken our break to also engage further on. I think one of the areas that we can think about this more and more critically is around the role of current and existing businesses in the business private sector in our countries. They do play a big role. Um, if you've delved further into thinking about critical mass theory and the role that 20% of either um, the, critical part, the critical parties or leadership can actually take to affect change in our communities, in our, in our businesses, one of the hopes that I have is the role of the coalition of the willing. So how do we gather more business leaders? How do we gather others within community to actually demand for some of this change? How do we engage with young people so that they're the critical drivers of some of these, of some of these demands for policy shifts and changes? What we've also seen is the role of uh, development partners, international bodies, foundations to drive more catalytic funding into our ecosystem and also pushing government to create necessary policies. One of the organizations I'll, I'll, I'll cite is MasterCard Foundation, who are working in 10 different African countries at the moment and have created uh, a multi-billion dollar investments around Young Africa Works in their partnership, not just with organizations, with youth organizations, with government. They are also pushing forward for a lot of reform, particularly reform in areas such as uh, technical and vocational colleges in our education systems, in funding and access to capital for SMSC growth as well in our countries. And so I think they're put, like levers that we can push and pull to ensure that we do move towards more action by our governments. But again, we cannot wait for that to happen. But we do know that in order for our young people to thrive, for their businesses to thrive, government will be necessary. And so we need to use all the levers that we can to ensure that this happens. Thank you. Does anybody want to ask a question? Yeah, please keep it brief. Um, no, I'm, so we're going to start down here. Just project. Never mind the mic. We don't have the time. Just project. What, what, where does the space of the African silent entrepreneur, the farmers, whether old or young, women, doing their egg to just do the minimum that is required? OK, the silent entrepreneurs. There were a couple of hands on this side. We're gonna balance it. We'll go one male, one female. I don't wanna get into trouble. Yes, please. Hi, um, particularly to Kola. So um, you spoke about a number of unicorns, three to be precise across the continent that gives the case. 
But what would you like to say about unicorns per capita or per population to either buttress or actually refute what you're saying in terms of the success of uh, the ecosystem? Thank you very much. There was another hand up there, but you were nodding in agreement. Was that kind of what you were getting at? I actually wanted to touch on the penetration, especially since you mentioned the VC market blowing up. We started from a very low base, right? So 100% growth year on year is quite easy to do in that regards as well, too. But the point I wanted to make is that there's a very subtle difference in both examples that you give, because you talk in particular about MSMEs and the definition of entrepreneurship is very different in both cases, Correct. right? Because a flutterware entrepreneur is very different to uh, uh, someone hawking food on the side of the road, who is an incredible African entrepreneur, by the way, as well, too, right? And cannot be dismissed. But the pockets of growth that we see around around the continent when it comes to I'm going to have to ask you to land real quick. The, li the likes like Flutterwave, they grew out of uh, they leapfrogged out of very, very poor policies and they were able to because it was through software but big businesses manufacturing and 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 large kind of industry and trade it's very hard without the right policies in place so it was more of a comment than, than a comment. all right thank you um yeah teresa um absolutely and i'll be addressing the first query on the silent entrepreneur because it's something that we've spoken quite recently on um we asked about the role of agriculture in africa understanding that a lot of the our young a lot of women particularly 60 percent of those working within the agriculture are women, within the agriculture sector are women. And so the question was, um, should we be focusing on just manufacturing and some of these other large scale um, export industries versus thinking about an, a sector that employs the majority, not just of our populations, but of women. And my, my understanding and my take is this, we will have more employment within those sectors, but not growth, not significant growth in order to catapult our economies simply by focusing on agriculture until we think about technological investment advancements that will allow us to add into the value chain of agriculture. And I think there's a lot of things to be said about the intrinsic aspects of providing employment through ag or any other sector that encompasses such a majority share of our people. And I think it's not just about job, having a work and, and employment, it's also around dignity. And I think the role of agriculture of the silent entrepreneur is toil is adding to our economy, but they will not necessarily be the largest drivers unless we think about the integration of technology. What will be is if we think about growing some of the SMSCs to be large businesses that can export their products, their services, ensuring that our economies do grow. There is certainly a role for every single entrepreneur across the continuum of economic growth within our countries. There's also the role of the intrinsic when you think about dignity and job creation. Thank you, Theresa. Kola, silent entrepreneurs and very specific challenge too. Yeah, I'll try to combine them all. Yeah, I think um, this conversation is a, is a very nuanced conversation because there are various types of entrepreneurs as you've uh, uh, recognized. And I think the focus of my, of my uh, position uh, where the ID is the, the high, large growth, fast growing, innovative uh, startups that I think are very reflective of, of the capacity of the African youth. Uh, we need SMEs, we need small scale entrepreneurs, we need agricultural entrepreneurs. But as Theresa said, I would, I would agree with you on that point, is those types of SMEs are going to power the base and the core of our economy, but they are not going to deliver the, the growth that and, and the leaps and bounds that we need as a continent. Now, I also think that the impact of regulation, uh, you know, uh, is, is, a, is a bit of a sliding scale as you think about the, the different types of entrepreneurship. And I think uh, the unicorns that I referenced were particularly used as examples because I think uh, getting a company to scale from zero to one and then to unicorn is reflective of what is possible in spite of regulation. Right, uh, a small SME can operate without being on the radar of a government, but a unicorn cannot exist without being on the radar of the government. And so, it is my view that yes, we may not yet have um, uh, a a competitive per capita uh, presence of unicorns on the continent, but I think we are certainly headed in the right direction. And I'm very proud to add that across the continent, not just in Nigeria or Senegal, these founders are coming together to collaborate with government to put together policies and bills. Uh, at last count, there's, there are five countries on the continent that are, have either passed or, at the, or are at the final stages of passing various kinds of bills, generally called startup bills. So this, in my view, is indicative of, of, of the way 
policy and regulation can actually be demand driven by the practitioners themselves. Thank you. Okay, how are we doing for time? Yeah, that's it. Okay, before we wrap up, I want to just take the temperature of the room. Who, who have you found more convincing? Show of hands. Those in favor of Teresa, hands up. Well, uh oh, okay. Kola? Uh, it looks pretty balanced, actually. Don't care, anyone? <laughs> no? Okay. How about both? You know what? So I hope that's not just in f to be fair to both of them because they're such lovely people, but a comment on the reality, of course, being that there's overlap here. We clearly need some of both, but thank you so much, Colin and Teresa, and thanks to all of you. And uh, next is climate change. There you go. Good luck. All right. Yeah, sure. I guess there's a, there's a pattern of forming here with the ladies to the right and to the left. Okay. Um, moving, moving along and standing on existing protocols. Um, uh, I believe we also have people joining us online. So a shout out to the silent majority, I'm hoping, um, who are participating online. Um, my name is Debbie Sierra, as uh, Jackie uh, had introduced uh, earlier. And we are going to have an engaging discussion uh, between Natalie Foti and Sheni Suleiman on climate change. Um, Natalie is going to support the position of countries demanding uh, rep well, I wouldn't say reparations, but uh, demanding the countries that have contributed the most uh, to climate change, of course, we know it's anthropogenic, um, should pay for it. Um, and Shani, on the other hand, is uh, defending the position that countries should just get along, get on, get on with the job of uh, innovating. Uh, climate change is already here. We, we can't uh, get bogged down with fighting who pays who for what. Uh, we all need to dig deep, innovate. Uh, and get along as a, <clears throat> a body of humanity. So, um, I think, I, I, Larry, I, I really, I really liked your your strong um, um, words um, to the to the to the debaters. So you have five minutes each. Um, we will then have uh, ten minutes for questions from the audience. So to prime you, if you have questions, um, just okay. So you see the hand up. You see the hand up? Try and get her attention during the debates. So once we go to the Q&A, we move really quickly so we can have as many questions as possible. Um, now, I think we had the, we had, we had ladies first um, for, the, pro, for the last. Yeah, the pro person first. No, no, there's no pro or anti here. <laughs> They're just two positions. So for this one, Jenny, you have the honors. Over to you. With pleasure. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen distinguished members of this fantastic audience. My name is Shani Suleiman. I'm from Nigeria, and I'm here to make a compelling case for why I believe that instead of trying to figure out who's at fault, who should pay who, what Africa deserves from the West, we should instead channel more of our energy into innovating around the problems we face around climate change coming up with the solutions that will solve our problems and potentially in the process of doing that, uh, create the solutions that will solve the world's problems and then become leaders in solving the climate change crisis. That's my position. So I think before I go into the details there, I'll start with a small story. Um, I'm not sure if anyone here has read a book called Things Fall Apart by uh, Chino Achebe. Now, what I found fascinating about that book, there are many, many stories to take away from that, but for me, you know, these villages and these communities were so focused on looking inward, right? There was all this culture and all these systems and all these practices that we, you know, we as, as the members of those villages were consumed by in a way that by the time some of the foreigners visited, we weren't paying attention to their intent, what they were doing. Um, and at the end of this, of this book, to spoil it for those of you who haven't read it, uh, ultimately, uh, Unfortunately, 
these, these villages in Africa basically were conquered by uh, colonialists. And I think of climate change in a very similar fashion. We are spending so much time saying, how do we get Africa to unite to fight and combat these other people? And in the process of doing so, uh, it's becoming very clear that no one is actually listening to us. And one day we'll wake up and our lands will be devastated. Um, the rainfall will dry up. We will have no food. We'll have a lot more poverty. And we would have had a chance, a very, very long window of time where if we just refocus our attention looking outward, we may have actually been able to reduce the impact of climate change. So um, what can we do? What can we do? We'll get to that in a second. Before we can talk about the things we can do, let's talk about some things we agree on. And I think I would agree with my uh, competitor here on a few different things about how important climate change is and how devastating it is. But a few things we can agree on. One is that climate change has a very disproportionate impact on Africa. We know that. We can agree to that. We can also agree that Africa is contributing the least to the creation of the negative impact of climate change, which feels very unfair, but it's true. We can agree to that as well. We can also agree that developed nations like the US and China, who are the biggest contributors to climate change, tend to act out of self-interest, not because they're nice. And what this means is we can probably also agree that as Africans, we don't have sufficient leverage to force or compel the guiltiest parties into finding the solutions for us. You can probably agree on that, right? So if you agree on that, what will we do with that information? I think what we can do is number one, let's keep driving more awareness. Yes, I'm not saying we should just sit back, fold our arms and say, it's not important, let's ignore this. No, let's drive more awareness. Let's invest in innovative ways to drive more awareness. We can create games that people can play. And while they're playing the game, they don't realize that they're learning more about the devastating impact on climate change. We can create movies and TV shows that have a global audience. One more minute. And embedded in there is the impact of climate change. There are lots of people already who care about this topic. We can join forces and alliances with them to be more deliberate about how we communicate the issue. But more importantly, we have to build. And so my argument is we have drought resistance crop varieties, which will help with agriculture. We have early warning systems for disasters, which we can help to create. We have animal disease surveillance, which can use artificial intelligence and machine learning, which don't exist today. In many cases, we can create them. We have advanced irrigation systems, which are due to be created, and no one has really done this at scale. We can do them. And of course, I'll leave this conversation by saying there's a $26 trillion economy ahead of us, the new climate economy. Africa can create the solutions that tap into this massive revolution and build the future for the world. All right, ladies and gentlemen, give a hand to Sini. Thank you very much. I think this is going to be an easy one for you then, Natalie. <laughs> well, the floor is yours. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Natalie Forti, and I will present my case um, based on, on the points that my contender has talked about by presenting the facts. Africa is the continent that will be hardest hit by climate change. Erratic rainfall, cyclones, floods, and heat waves and drought, uh, subsequent crop failures, among others, have in fact already begun to change the face of our continent. Agriculture is a major contributor to many African economies, in which 90 to 95% of the agriculture activity is rain-fed cropland, relying on unpredictable weather patterns. Climate change is making it more and more difficult to realize the benefits of agriculture productivity and posing new threats to the world food systems. The countries of the African continent are home to 17% of the world's population, but produce less than 3% of the world's cumulative CO2 emissions. Anglo-American countries are less than 15% of the world's population, but produce 59% of those emissions. Yet it is Africa where climate catastrophe is not a future threat, but a daily lifestyle. In Southern Africa, for example, years of severe drought have led to water supplies disappearing, 
uh, crop failures and 45 million people being displaced and going hungry. Landslides and floods in East Africa impacted 3 million lives in just the last three months of 2019. Violent swings from drought to floods have unleashed a plague of locusts threatening the food supply of tens of millions of people. Cyclones are more deadly, destructive, and frequent. Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Malawi in 2019 had the first back-to-back -back cyclones ever recorded, leaving 2.5 million people in dire need of humanitarian relief, and in Mozambique alone. We can go on and on, but I guess you get the point. Even after the most significant COP21, where countries set ambitious targets to fight climate change and a hundred billion was pledged to Africa's first fight against climate change. Another COP26 came, climate change was discussed and the West again delay delayed establishing the fund to support climate action. It also emerged that the US and Europe had actively sabotaged a mechanism that would require rich countries to pay restitution to Africa. To date, only 80 billion has been received with 67% going to mitigation and 33% going to adaptation. Africa received only 26% uh, of the available financing between 2016 and 2019. Three quarters of that was in the form of loans and other non-grant instruments that must be repaid. <laughs> Most has been directed towards cutting emissions or mitigation with adaptation assigned only 21% of the global climate funding in 2018. And yet what Africa needs right now is adaptation financing to help to live with the phenomenon. The global North leaders have a moral responsibility to do two things immediately, stop and reverse the trend of global warming greenhouse gas emissions need to be cut rapidly, ensuring the global temperatures do not rise to not more than two degrees Celsius above their current level that we had before the industrialized uh, countries started to burn coal and oil. Current efforts on both fronts are insufficient to meet the challenge facing us and decisive action must be taken now. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Natalie. Uh, we've got a minute to spare. So, Seni, I think um, it, it's only fair that I, 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 I start my questions with you. Uh, but for, for the uh, purpose of, of, of having or engaging the audience, uh, in the global climate change debate, we have two broad strategies. There's mitigation, uh, reducing the impacts of activities and contributing to climate change, and adaptation adapting to a, ch uh, a changing climate. So, Sandy, you don't dispute that we, we are experiencing climate change. Absolutely. And you don't dispute that Africa or African countries are, you know, have this disproportionate uh, impact. Exactly. Now, what is your solution? Because you had five minutes and we didn't hear a single solution on innovation or leapfrogging. So what, can you, can you give us specific ideas on what leapfrogging means Absolutely. for an African country. I think there are times when I sit through a conversation and uh, I walk away saying I didn't really hear what was discussed, but in reality, maybe I wasn't paying attention. So I'm not going to fault you uh, for not paying attention. Touche. But instead, I will uh, kindly and politely repeat myself. Uh, I'm sure the audience- If you're going to repeat what was already there, I would, I would suggest that you give us specifics. So give, give, a, give, a, give, a, give a country, and give an innovation. Absolutely, we're happy to. All right. Uh, so I'm going to talk about three very, very specific things that have been done, um, you know, aside from the ones I already talked about. Let's take Morocco, for example, the country most of us know. Uh, Morocco, not sure if you're aware of this, but currently has the largest, the world's largest concentrated solar facility in the entire world. This was done by a very deliberate effort not to wait for help, not to wait for assistance, not to complain, but instead to build the future. And now Morocco has a plan to make renewable energy account for 52% of the energy sources. That is one of the most direct ways of contributing to the reduction of um, emission, global emissions that cause climate change. However, the longer term plan for Morocco is once they can get this right, they can begin to help the rest of the world think through how to apply this in their own countries and begin to export the technology. One example. The second one is from Niger, where 
an amazing entrepreneur has invented a tele irrigation system. And what that means is wherever in the world a farm owner is, they can use their mobile phone to turn the irrigation systems on or off, monitor everything and get water from places where it's diff places where there's an abundance of water to places where there's a scarcity of water. Now you can imagine all these large countries in the US, Russia, elsewhere, they don't have the technology yet. They will eventually. We have a window of time where we can actually, it's been patented already. This company in Niger has the rights globally. We can sell it to them, make billions of dollars and also improve the planet at the same time. Okay. These are examples of how we can do this. Thank you, Seni. Um, just a quick follow-up. How are these innovations funded? Who's paying for them? I think this is where uh, my competitor and I probably agree. So I think that- So you're making her part case. of it. Absolutely. I think the good thing about life is sometimes you can disagree and then find mutual areas of agreement. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done, well done, well done. Natalie, um, <clears throat> so we're, we're, we're looking at a changing, changing climate. Whether or not the UNFCCC mechanism, this is the UN uh, process where we have annual meetings towards addressing climate change, are not legally binding. And so even if you never get this hundred billion, or shall we say the hundred billion dollar promise, is it a, a case of waiting for Godot? What if it never comes? What then? I think as African countries uh, rightly said, what if it never comes? It hasn't come since we, the COP21, but African uh, communities have been on the ground doing from a grassroots level, the best that they can to adapt to climate change in terms of government putting in policies uh, for climate smart agriculture within the communities and going back to their roots in terms of what we used to do before the green revolution came uh, to increase our productive capacity and also help us adapt to climate change. So I think there's work being done at the grassroots and farmers are realizing that you, you are living with this phenomenon. So as you are living with this phenomenon, you have to find ways to live with climate change. Okay, I, I, wanna, I wanna push back again. Mm -hmm. What if the money doesn't come? What then? What options do African countries have? What leverage do they have in engaging or negotiating uh, with other countries that are deemed to be causing more of the pollution, contributing to climate change? The leverage that they have is the fact that the global north caused the problems. So they have, to, they have a moral obligation to actually give us the funds that we need to accelerate the adaptation to climate change. So we look at the uh, global north, everything seems to be good. They have good values. They have good democracy systems, uh, better than what Africa has. So they debatable, say that they debatable. have debatable, but then they say they have values that they uphold that have made them the great nations that they are. And part of those values is paying back to those that you have wronged or making right the things that you have wronged. So I think in terms of having an ethical and moral obligation in terms of climate justice, I think they would do well to do that. But in the event that it doesn't come, yeah. as I was talking about to say, African societies are dynamic. They are able to adapt to the changes that are coming and governments within the uh, African countries need to put in policies in place and financing from their taxation and uh, business uh, enterprises that are, that are operating within the economies to fund this change. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Um, over to the audience. Questions? One, two, three. Thank you. Um, I have a question for both, please. Um, for Sini, um, your story uh, based on the Chinua Achebe book uh, to me sounded a little bit patronizing. So I wonder if you might be able to think through what um, indigenous knowledge and indigenous systems can actually contribute towards designing new systems for Africa going forward in a changing climate. Um, and, and for you, um, in an ideal world, if the global north does change its systems, there might be a time where Africa is actually contributing more to the emissions than they are. Should African countries at this point in time start setting aside money for those reparations, which might then be charged back to us? <laughs> Very good questions. Next. Hi, um, <clears throat> my question as an expert in supply chain assessments for the last 10 years is, where's this lithium, the cobalt, the bauxite coming from? It's coming from Jharkhand, it's coming from Congo, 
is coming from South America, is coming from indigenous Australia. To get the minerals, hundreds of them, you need to rip up the forests, you need to dig two miles deep into the soil, 10 football fields by 10 each, take all the water out, bear with me. Straight you to the to question, please. Yes, there's an environmental yeah. cost for this. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. so you what's your question? Use, you need to use tons of oil as well for these wind turbines. My question is mm -hmm. twofold. Firstly, you want reparations. No, you don't need reparations. You just, just a question, to... just a question, not an opinion. No, it's not an opinion. You're making an opinion. Give, give us a question. Right. The question is, where do these blood resources come from for the wind, solar and the electric? And why is EU still collecting 500 billion euros every year from Africa through Congo and Cameroon and Senegal? It's a colonial tax. Simple. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And the third question was in front. Yeah. Are you... Yeah. For us who are blind not to look for a black cat in a dark room, which is not even there. Please ask your question. <laughs> how do we get the data that can influence the discussion on climate change for the global issues? Very good question. Very good question. All right. Who's ready? Who's ready to start? Seni? I can take the first one. All right. Um, to start with yeah. about the indigenous solutions. And, um, you know, of course, I would say, Thanks for your question. I apologize if I- Straight to your you. answer, straight to your answer. We're running out of time. <laughs> I'm glad you're she excited knows. about the she question. Knows. Yeah. Well, when I hear the word indigenous solution, I get confused because when we see innovations out of China, the US, Russia, Japan, we don't think of them as indigenous. We think of them as solutions. So with Africa, I think they're solutions. And one of the most enterprising Africans in the world has actually made climate change one of the most important topics in the world and has singularly played one of the biggest roles in making the world, getting the world on a path to less climate impact. And that entrepreneur is globally recognized and known as Elon Musk, South African. And so I believe that the mindsets and the innovation that comes from Africans can become global products, global solutions, not indigenous, but global. We okay. have one example. I mean, I need Natalie. Your, your question. Um, Thanks, Seni. I'll answer the first question. Um, should we be saving for the future? Right? That's the question, right? The question is, African countries might become the net uh, um, uh, polluters. And so is there a future scenario where African countries will have to pay reparations? So should they be saving for that future scenario yeah. now? I think, yes, uh, Africa should be saving. And only I quantify this by saying, if we are allowed to grow in the same way that the global North also grew, then it would be fair for us to pay when we make the money that they have also been able to make. Super. Maybe last Sydney. question, yeah. uh, which I think, you know, speaking of black hats uh, and <laughs> how do we get the data? Uh, I'd say probably two ways. One is by starting the journey of having people that are studying PhDs and researchers begin to actually focus on this space. And then a tactic of partially appealing to our own governments because we need the data to become more able to solve the problem. But also, just like uh, Natalie over here said, let's guilt trip the West. People usually respond to specific requests. I say fund research, they'll say yes. Yeah, okay. So, so we're done. Uh, this was a really engaging, engaging session. Um, uh, to say, to say, to say whether we're waiting for Godot, whether African economies are going to deindustrialize because of climate change or not industrialize. Uh, to get your information, we already have information. The challenge is not information. Are we going to wait on the good graces and morals of other countries, polluting countries? I don't know if that's if if the COVID experience is anything. Uh, then you know I I don't know what 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 the future portends, uh, but. This has been an engaging, engaging debate. Uh, we've, we've got people uh, across the audience nodding heads, and you know, at least no one stormed the stage and slapped me yet. So I, I think I think I think I'm doing a good job. Um, <laughs> so, um, show of hands, um, do you believe African countries should pursue? Um, a, a strategy of getting countries that are contributing more to climate change to to fund their adaptation or mitigation efforts. Show of hands. Okay. 
Um, show of hands for people who support uh, domestic innovation or domestic approaches, taking our own future into our own hands. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it is right. Exactly. You know. You know. When I when I was given, I I do. I I'm not going to do the British thing now and apologize and flagellate myself on the stage. But um, it it is a tough it is a tough tough debate, right? We have to adapt. We have to mitigate. On one hand, people have to fund climate change. On the other hand, where does the money come from? Some of it will come from those who are polluting if they can, you know, part with their pennies and others, you know, we have to be more responsible and invest domestically. So uh, please give a round of applause. To our <laughs> okay, Ronak, you're up. Right, good evening, everyone. I think we are ready for the next topic, Africa in the new global order. This is a topic that uh, is one that I spend a lot of time researching in my work. I'm a political economist by background. I work for a company called Signal Risk, where I'm a director and do some academic work as well. So it's, it's something that I find fascinating and quite interesting and, and looking forward to hearing the views of both panelists today. Um, and it's a topic I think that elicits a lot of emotive debate given the continent's history through the Cold War, where it was subject to exploitation. Uh, I think in this new uh, era where Africa is again becoming the theater of competition in a great superpower rivalry, um, there are a lot of questions that need to be asked. Are we going to be kingmaker? Are we going to be piggy in the middle? Or are we going to go a third or different way? Uh, and I think, you know, given recent trends that we've seen with China being more selective in its lending, with the IMF playing a greater role across the continent, and of course, with the Russia-Ukraine conflict and African states voting in different ways and taking different positions in, in this conflict, I think that... Um, and that's something that, that, that shows that there's a lack of uniformity around the way the continent is ap approaching this geopolitical equation going forward. And the set of choices are, of course, uh, going to be quite fundamental in, in determining economic outcomes. So to debate this today, we've got Memuna and we've got Mayur, uh, who are going to be taking <laughs> some interesting positions. Memuna, you're going to be arguing that we should align based on historical factors. And Mayur, you're going to be arguing that we need a different perspective. Um, so let's start with you, Memona. Uh, let us hear your perspectives. Hello, everyone. So my name is Maimuna, and I do believe that African countries should align with uh, countries that have supported us in the past and communities as well. And I think that this tends to take me back to colonialism the colonial period. And when we look at colonialism, it wasn't just political or cultural or economical. It was also psychological. And that psychological effect is still here today in this pre present uh, moment. And when we African look at ourselves, the way we understand our history, the way we grasp the world, the way we define ourselves, the way we acquire knowledge, all stems from the past interactions that we have had with uh, the, the colonial period and the communities that with whom we interacted at that period. And uh, if I look at our language, most of the official languages of all the 54 African countries are either English, French, Portuguese, and language is an important part of identity and we share that with the West. And if you look again at the economical aspects, uh, colonialism was done to deplete Africa of our businesses and our money, but that still remain today into the patterns, the economical patterns that you can see and into the links that Africa have with the West through the companies with whom they do businesses. And if you look at Politically, we have had independence, but we didn't cut the political ties with the West. If you also look at 
um, the people, you are part of the African people and you are here in England all over linking us to the West. So for me, this is a shared history that we cannot forget. And that shared history is based on colonialism, based on glo globalism. So we are not inherently African. We are also African Western. We are all these communities. And because of that, I believe that we need to remain in alliance with the West. And if I look at the Commonwealth, it's merely um, changing a little bit imperialism for alliances. So again, alliance is the key. How can we align ourselves with the West with whom we share so much in terms of identity? How can we align ourselves with them? I think that if we um, look, for example, uh, in if we take the West is our largest uh, donors, they give us the most money. They, they are also our largest uh, uh, economic contributors with 20, 30 billions uh, uh, in terms of trade, whereas uh, China only give us 20 billions. So we have these um, ways of working together that is historical and that is in the present. And I think that we should remain, we should keep those ties and not necessarily go for new partnerships, but work in renewing our interest in looking at what is important to us. And if you look at what is important to us, the West, uh, especially Ukraine, we take 40% uh, of our wheat in Ukraine. So should we just uh, leave the uh, Ukraine go in flame? Where are we gonna take our food? And this is a way for us, food security is really important. And we, we think also strategically, we'll see that in terms of oil and fuel, because right now Russia is not doing business with the West, it's, uh, it's an opportunity for African countries to do uh, business with uh, the West. Countries such as um, Egypt are doing that right now. So for me, we just need to Re -see, um, to rethink about how to have new alliances and the African Union and EU is a good way for us to do that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Four minutes. Okay, before we turn to uh, Mayur, I'm a little bit nervous. I've got to say the last time two men of Indian descent expressed strong <laughs> political opinions, the government of this uh, country fell apart. So don't do too much damage. Um, Mayor, over to you. Uh, does that make you Sajid or Rishi? Which of the, <laughs> which of the two? Uh, good evening to our magnificent chairperson. I, I hope you will be kind on both of us. Uh, to our Tutu fellows, past and present. Uh, to the SOAS members. I've always said SOAS is the best university in the UK. And ladies and gentlemen. I want you to think about three things. Allies interests and time allies interests and time who do we partner with what are our allegiances what are the core interests that we care about as africans what is our main strategic agenda and time is there anything about the past moving into the future that we have to rethink some of this some people would have us believe that all we need to do is stay rooted in the historical ties that we have as a continent that this is what is going to keep us safe and secure in a dangerous world. There are others who think we need to ditch all of that, that we have to unburden ourselves from our colonial past and move and look east. Neither of those are truly satisfying answers to the big problem. If you look at what we're living through, it is a time of immense, incredible change. There is a huge shift in the balance of power that is happening globally and affecting our region. I want you to think back with me to a time of similar massive upheaval. This is a time in the 1840s in Europe, what had become known as the spring time of the peoples. It was a massive revolutionary force that swept starting in France and moved into parts of Germany, Austria, Hungary. And it was a shift among reformers who were looking to unburden themselves from monarchic structures. It was a period of massive upheaval and change. And during that moment, the British government at the time was trying to find a way to navigate that shift within its own region. And Lord Palmerston, who was the Prime Minister of Europe, the uh, Prime Minister of Britain, excuse me, at the time, came under immense criticism. And in two magnificent speeches in front of Parliament, he said this, we have no permanent allies, only permanent 
interests. No permanent allies, only permanent interests. That advice was wise counsel then, and it is wise counsel for us today in Africa. As the chairperson rightly said, things are shifting underneath us right now. The biggest flashpoint we have geopolitically is the Russia-Ukraine war. And there are some who believe that this is a fight between autocracy and democracy. But whose fight is that? Who has painted it in that picture? Is that our fight? We know what these ideological battles have looked like in the past. In the 90s, we were led to believe that we were emerging into a clash of civilizations. We saw how that turned out. And so we need to be able to reject that view. What we care about in Africa is not autocracy versus democracy. We care about effective government. Effective government that delivers services for its people. And we know democracies that have been captured by the state. We've also seen autocracies who have delivered incredible gains for human development. So this is not our fight. What we need in Africa today as we navigate the global environment is we need an approach that is about pragmatism not ideology. We need an approach that's about the future, not about our past. And we need an approach that's about our ability to understand how we manage multiple alliances and not choose sides. One minute. Choosing sides is not who we are. If you look at the big issues today that we face, climate change, pandemic health resilience, and economic growth, this is what the lesson is. Figure out how to navigate multiple partners. On climate change, we know the story. We have polluted the least and we're the most affected. We're like the kind of person at the party who drank the least while everyone else was partying and somehow we woke up with the biggest hangover. So what do we do? Do we say China is the biggest polluter? 10 billion tons of CO2. So we need to align ourselves to the US and the uh, West? No, because we also know that there is an argument that says we need their technology. So it is complex. We can't choose sides. When it comes to pandemic resilience, do the countries in Africa who are most aligned to the US somehow get exemptions from travel, ban uh, travel bans. No, there were borders across the whole. And when you actually look, China provided some of the most largest volumes of vaccines across the entire continent. So we have to balance our interests here. And if you look at economic growth, time. 500 million people are still in extreme poverty today. And it is a story that's a bit complex. It is not about the vast volumes of money. <laughs> we have to have permanent interests, not permanent allies. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so I want to anchor this around something that you guys both said. It's about choices, it's about agency in this new context. But what the African continent is being asked to do is very unique. We must democratize and industrialize simultaneously. We must do so while it's going green. Uh, there's a context of premature deindustrialization. And just by the way, we're not going to give you vaccines. All right. So if we take all of this context and we root it in this current reality, and this is a question to both of you, and we've seen different voting patterns at the UN Security Council, some countries aligning with, with Russia, some countries condemning Russia, uh, some countries have historical affiliations with, with, with Russia, some pursuing ideological, some pragmatic approaches, some claiming a moral and human rights approach. Which is the right approach? And that's a question to both of you. Okay. So for me, because the impact of this war, the indirect impact is greater on Africa. And so because of that, we cannot just be neutral. We cannot say that we are uh, not partaking in this war and not aligning just because of the impact. If you look at the, the food price index has risen and also in terms of the prices for fertilizers also has gone up. And it's a, national, it's a national food security issue. If you look at India, for example, they've chosen not to do any export anymore because of uh, the impact that the war of Ukraine has had. And like I said, uh, Africa takes 44% of its wheat in Ukraine. So how can we sit and say that we are not taking part of it? We have to align with one side or the other. And for me, that side is our traditional allies with whom we already have had uh, success in the partnership. So for me, this is the way to go to secure the food uh, for our people and also to be able to uh, be opportune in the um, op uh, economics opportunities that we can take right now when Russia is doing something else, we can go for oil, we can go for uh, other stuff. 
So I want to challenge you a little bit on that. So the, you know, a lot of countries will claim that Russia was their ally during the Cold War. Russia uh, under the Soviet Union uh, provided support, ideological uh, arms, all kinds of support that they needed. So why wouldn't they align with, with Russia? Well, uh, if like Guinea, for example, which is my country, was aligned a little bit with uh, Russia, then with uh, the US. Um, but for me, when you look at the Cold War, like the, major like the majority of uh, African countries didn't really align. It was non-alignment with uh, India and other countries. And when you look at the consequences for that, it was very bad in terms of we didn't have any growth. We had more corruption, more conflict, because it was a, a form of scramble for Africa, again, uh, having to uh, align with this or that and it's important for us through the AU to come uh, under the presidency of Macky Sall to come in one voice and say that uh, because it's so important anyway for African countries the um, um, traceability of the frontiers to say because of all of this and the stake and direct stakes that are so high for Africa not only about food security but uh, we are diverting the aid from Africa, development aid from Africa to helping Ukraine. So all of this, you can only have this conversation through the G7, through uh, EU, Africa, uh, AU uh, reunions. So for me, alignment is the answer. Thank you. Mahir, same question. Yeah, so if you look at what happened in the last vote in the UN, which was an attempt to dismiss Russia out of the Human Rights Council, over 50 countries abstained, voted against, and about half of those were African. And I think that was exactly the right approach to remain strategically neutral in those forums. That doesn't mean we don't care about the issues. Likewise, an abstention in the UN isn't the same as inactivity. There's an incredible amount of work that is happening behind the scenes in the BRICS and elsewhere to help navigate a way through this crisis. Maimouna is absolutely right. We are badly affected by this issue in Africa. But the issue around food security and agricultural crisis is actually a complex one. Because yes, on the one hand, Ukraine is an incredible breadbasket for provision of all sorts of commodities into our markets, Egypt and others. But on the other hand, Russia and Belarus are some of the biggest exporters of fertilizer in the world, which we depend on and rely on. And so if you're going to figure out a way to navigate this, you've got to be able to engage both of these parties in this. Great. Um, so one more question before we open up to the floor. So we've had the era of the Washington consensus global capitalism, democratization, liberalism. It seems that we've, we've had a bit of a reversal now, the, the era of the bigger state of, of more nationalism, more isolationism. Are we in an era of the Bayesian consensus? A lot of African leaders seem to, to kind of like that model. Are we tending that way? <laughs> fair, fair, fair. You know, I think the, you know, the pendulum swings in international affairs and how we think about the big ideas of the day in terms of economic policy. You're quite right, we did have the Washington Consensus, which was a neoliberal market-driven set of reforms to drive economic growth. The alternative is a Beijing Consensus, which basically says we need centralized government, huge amount of planning in order to kickstart the economy. Like most pendulums, neither end is sustainable, right? We have to find our own Kampala Consensus or our own Nigeria Consensus, right? We can't rely on others. And I think what we're seeing today is that it actually doesn't matter what the form of government is. What is more important is that it is driven by a focus on the development and serving its people. Because that is the, the great kind of irony. We have seen true democracies who have followed major market-led reforms collapse. And we've also seen countries who've been incredibly centralized in their economic planning, not have the skills and capabilities to actually implement. I'm going to stop you there because we need to take some questions. Uh, one, Rob Tell, and then come here. Let's start at the back. Sure. Quick question, no comment, please. Yeah. Thank you, Marmona. Um, I was just, I was wondering, Guinea Conakry was one of the first countries in Africa to become independent. I'm from Cape Verde. We've known the history of farming, systemic farming, the entire history of that nation before independence. So if the relationship was so successful, why did we fight blood for independence? Because uh, it's a good, good answer. And I so think- let's, let's, before ah, you answer, let's, okay. let's take a round. Mm -hmm. So my question is why can't development and democracy coexist? Why do they have to be mutually exclusive? Good question. And one at the back there. Okay. 
Hi. Um, my question is, how should Africa, the continent, um, reconcile previous atrocities by Western nations or allies, um, some as that are still so present um, in our existing, you know, um, way of life? <clears throat> and what, second question is, what would make the alignment this second time to our previous colonizers any different, you know, uh, against the atrocities, against the, you know, brutality of it all? Like, what has changed? Cool. Good question. Okay. So independence, democracy, development, mm -hmm. uh, atrocities, and making sure that realignment is win-win going forward. Okay. First question to you, man. So, um, Guinea, which is a good example, I think, um, we were the ninth country uh, in Africa to gain independence and the first in West Africa to say no. And so we, we didn't align with the, um, the if you want, the, the, the political, um, we didn't align with what was expected. And in a way we paid the price and we still are paying the price today in Guinea. And uh, so this is why I tell myself that alignment is so important, especially if you are just one country saying no. What happened simply is that because we didn't align, nobody else followed through. We were the only one marginalized and we couldn't stay in that concert of nations and we were on the brink of this, uh, this destruction, having to uh, fend for ourselves with everything. And when you look at other countries uh, whom align, such as Ivory Coast, Senegal, today, when you look, the development is not the same uh, in those countries. So for me, we have to be, um, and this is a good case, Guinea, we have to be intelligent in the alignment. We can align until we have all the, the toolkits and all the money we need to, for development. Once that development is assured, then we, if, if, if we want, we can claim more uh, liberty or cut complete ties. Cool. Uh, quick answer. We're running out of time. Yeah. Uh, democracy and development, are they mutually exclusive? I don't think they are. And um, when you look at the track record, some of our most effective democracies in the continent, Botswana has had incredible growth. And even a place like Zambia, which has actually been in a place of incredible transition, you know, of peaceful transitions of power between opposition and ruling parties, has also started to deliver economic growth again and development. I think, though, we get too hung up on is democracy a prerequisite for economic development? And I think that just gets us in the wrong place. It becomes unhelpful because we have seen some of the most vibrant democracies. Take, for example, South Africa, that is an incredibly vibrant democracy, according to things like free speech, free press, et cetera, be ultimately captured by the state and end up in mass economic stagnation. So I think the track record is they're not exclusive. They can work together, but actually the focus really needs to be on how do you drive effective government and service delivery? OK, and then the question around um alignment uh, well past atrocities and then and then strategic alignment going forward who wants to take that i could simply say that um for me the first time we didn't align in the cold war and so it's not a second alignment it will be the true first alignment and i think that alignment should be strategic it's not just to align to follow past colonizers but right now those colonizers the past ones are in dire need um, uh, of people to follow them or to go with them because uh, what they've, the model that they've proposed against uh, Russia is not working and we can bargain for that alignment is to be strategic. And then when we need the, we don't need the alignment anymore, we can go back to uh, continuing on working with China and Russia. But... <laughs> Perhaps I can offer some some thoughts on that. Uh, thanks, Manuela. So, you know, there's uh, there's um, a tendency by a lot of African leaders to align with countries that are non-prescriptive because they find the West patronizing and paternalistic, uh, and there's baggage associated with that. I think the other issue is that in terms of economic diplomacy, where you've got your range of established powers, you know, and then you've got new entrants, the Indias, the Turkeys. Uh, the Russias of this, this world who are making a play, each are going to give you something. So this is where you've got strategic choices and you know, to the point around, around maximizing agency and choice, I think that's important. But then also this is where economies of scale become important and where the collective voice of the continent uh, matters because as a bunch of fragmented countries, 
versus uh, a unified voice um, of, of 55 countries, uh, I think you start to, to, to push your weight around in global affairs a lot more. Um, okay, I, Nick, how are we doing for time? You. Nine seconds. Okay, cool. So um, let's take a quick straw poll. Should we align on historical perspectives? Hands up, Maimuna's argument. <laughs> okay, and the other argument, pragmatism. Okay, I think both are important and finding the balance, of course, is, is critical. Thanks guys, uh, next debate. for the debate on leadership. Let's get ready to rumble. I've always wanted to say that, and now I've been given the opportunity. Come on up. So you're safe, hi. Good evening, everybody. Oh, I need more energy than that. This is the last debate of the evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hope that we have that kind of energy from the beginning until the end. So my name is Rob Tal Nije Paley, and I was a Tutu Fellow in 2010. I'm also an assistant professor at the London School of Economics. And this particular debate topic, focusing on leadership, Africa, integrity or lack thereof, is very close and dear to my heart. I actually write anti-corruption children's books. So it'll be interesting wow. to see what you have to say about corruption and the lack thereof on the continent of Africa. So we have two positions. And I think the positions are really about the difference between perception and reality. So in terms of the first position, Boniface Mwangi and Saif Abu Dhaid, they're going to be arguing for the fact that corruption is the biggest problem with leadership in the continent of Africa, in almost all countries, both in the public as well as in the private sector. On the other hand, our other contenders will argue uh, Diaka Kamara and Dalumuzi Malanga, I hope I pronounced that correctly, will argue that African leaders are no more corrupt than leaders across the globe. The problem is how Africa is portrayed in the media. So perception versus reality. So we'll start with the first group, uh, Boniface and Safe. please, you've got, now I've asked our fearless leader, um, Jackie, if we can have an extra bit of time because we have two on, on both, on two positions. So we're gonna give you six minutes each. Six so, each. Okay. Yes, so I'll give you a prompt. Uh, well, you don't have to take the full six minutes. You don't have to take the full six minutes. I will give you a prompt when it's three minutes in and then one minute in for you. Okay, so Boniface and Safe, you've got the floor. Okay. So a few years ago, uh, a young, motivated and ambitious young lady from Africa was very happy to know that the CEO of a strong, big corporation wants her to go to go with her on to go with him on uh, an international trip to do business little that she she did, did she know that he had ulterior motives and other intentions she went there super motivated to join the group only to find that it's only her and him started making moves started making advancements she politely refused until a moment where she completely broke up and she felt that she had nothing to go for. She had no one to go for. After a moment of collapse, she decided to go straight back to her country and file a lawsuit. And guess what? It took her five years to reach a decision. And guess what? The decision was not in her favor. The guy pulled, pulled all strings. His HR department pushed her out of the company. The, he, they started a smearing campaign against her within corporations. He made sure that he called every single CEO he knew to actually tell them that this person should not be employed. It took her six years to find another job. Corruption is simply misuse of power. 
it's not only in the political sphere. It's something that we all suffer from, right, left, and center, in politics, in economics, and even in arts. It's so prevalent that only 12 countries, it's so prevalent that 12 countries out of the last 20 countries and in Transparencies International Corruption Index come from Africa. Only three countries are in the top 50, Seychelles, Botswana, and Cape Verde. That's a population of 2.6 million people out of 1.3 billion people in the continent. So we're talking 0.02% of the whole continent that actually believe that they're getting some sort of transparency and, and equal access to opportunity. So it's not only happening to my friend, it's happening to all of us. African corruption is a sad fact, and it's better to confront harsh realities instead of hiding them under the rug. And confronting them requires a lot of courage because I stand before you right here getting very anxious that this Zoom video would be seen by the wrong people. <laughs> I might get into a lot of trouble. So it, it's giving me real anxiety. I know it could be funny, but it's actually something that I'm anxious about. Three more minutes. Uh, okay. See, you took the time. Thank you. Um, yeah. So fighting this is not only a moral responsibility, but it's also a way for all of us to, to prosper. But how do we start? It's a very, very hard endeavor. It's not about starting a company or creating a movie or something like this. We have to convince almost 55 African leaders to create more transparency in their countries. I guess changing the system might take a while, might take a lot longer than probably our lifetimes. But what, what I'm suggesting for us to do is to create pockets of hope. A lot of African leaders, democratic and dictators talk about industrial zones. Maybe it's time for us to create transparency zones. We have to start by our organizations and our communities where we don't misuse this kind of power. We have to take all the power that we can give to actually reverse this, this horrible, horrible trend. I know we will be talking about more solutions and I leave it for my friend here to talk about. All right, should they respond or you talk? No, go ahead. Right. Um, so at the very back, there's a young man called Jonathan, nine year old. So allow me to cast, fuck, that's not me. This suit, that's not me. And it was never me. I wanna tell you a story about, a two Kenyan story. So a Kenyan president comes to this country and meets the prime minister. They're hanging out. He goes to the prime minister's house. It's very nice says, how much do you earn to live in this nice, beautiful house? And the premise says, you know what? I took 10% from that project. Oh, the president says, well, that looks very good. So the prime minister visits Kenya and he comes and asks the Kenyan president to live in a palace. You have workers, you have servants, you have very freshly manicured loans, you have security, you will live in a very beautiful house. How did you get this? And the Kenyan president one says, one "I took yeah? one more minute. We have three minutes. It was three shared. minutes each. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought it was six minutes. I thought we had six minutes each. I can't make three minutes. You have six minutes total. Three minutes each. Continue. Uh, so, and he says, "Look at that project over there." He says, "I see nothing. There's no bridge. There's no nothing." He said, "Took hundred percent." And we learned corruption from the colonialists. In 1619, some Angolan, um, Angolan young men were minding their own business and they were, they were captured by the Portuguese and, and taken as slaves to Portugal. And that began the looting, the plunder of Africa. Today, Africa is poor because we learned corruption and looting from the Germans, from the French, from the brains, that's what we learned from. So we learned the best habits from the guys on the other side. We're gonna argue that Africa is not corrupt, but you run corruption from them. They take our coltan, they take our coffee, they take our cocoa, they take our gold. The biggest banks 
on our continent are foreign. The biggest companies are foreign. We lose eight, eight billion dollars through illicit, illicit financial flows. And so our argument is we're corrupt, but we learn from the best how to be corrupt. <laughs> Three minutes each, six minutes Okay. So thank you very much, Boniface and Safe. We're gonna have Diaka and Dalmuzi. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I mean, first of all, we'll begin by clarifying what our position is. Our position is that um, uh, the rest of the world is at the very least as corrupt as Africa or more, so. more corrupt than, than Africa. Um, and so there was reference from our from our opponents, as it were, um, to Transparency International. So we believe that a, a good starting point um, is to define what corruption is, and, and they were absolutely right. So you know, based on uh, a, a, a definition that we can both agree to, corruption is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. And that is one um, uh, definition. So in our debate, really, the real question is. In other parts of the world, is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain less prevalent or less intense than in Africa? And as I've mentioned, and as we will argue, we argue that um, really, at the very least, other parts of the world are as corrupt um, uh, than Africa. And that's sort of like a mild version of the argument. Um, and our more aggressive version of the argument is that other parts of the world are more corrupt than, than Africa. Um, there are really three things uh, that, that sort of like underpin our arguments. So I'll sort of like give an overview of what those uh, three pillars are. Um, and, and my colleague uh, Diaka will, 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 get, will delve a little deeper and, and give some examples. Um, and those three uh, sort, of, uh, sort of pillars of our argument are one, perception, second, uh, markets, and three, systems. From a perception perspective, um, I'm sure you might have come across this statistic, and this statistic really is to make a point um, and, and, and to illustrate our argument. Um, we all know sort of like the, not we all know, but the, you know, most of you probably know the distinction between the probability of dying in a plane crash versus dying from a road accident. Um, so, you know, different kinds of statistics out there, but the probability of dying from a flight crash is about one in 11 million and the probability of dying from a road accident is one in 5,000. So yet a lot of people, when they sort of like walk into a plane, they feel like they've got a greater chance of dying um, uh, in a plane. And, 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 and sort of like the researchers who sort of like worked through this figure out like, why is that the case? And really it all boils down to perception, right? The media puts out an article out there every year, every other year to say 300 people died in a plane crash. So it feels like it's you know, a greater probability of you dying in that plane crash. What we argue is that that is the case with corruption in Africa. You will see a headline about the king of Swaziland having bought Rolls Royces, Bentleys, uh, you know, flies in a private jet, uh, but is king of a country with a population of a million. Um, and that sort of like, you know, tempers with your perception of, of what uh, corruption is. The second is, uh, is markets, which is there is a market for corruption, right? There's a demand and supply aspect to corruption. For every person who receives a bribe, there's somebody else who's giving a bribe. And it's a global market for corruption. And then the third is that this is systemic, right? Uh, so what we believe is that the examples of Donald Trump, and Boris Johnson are not aberrations. They actually are reflections of the system that produces uh, people, people like that. Um, and how, you know, in, in, in closing, before I hand over to Diaka, is that while in Africa it takes low bro media to expose corruption, in other parts of the world it takes high bro investigative journalism that produces the Panama Papers, Pandora Papers, for us to actually correct that misconception that. Corruption is less endemic in other parts of the world. On a more sort of like, uh, please excuse my relative informality, but my tutu fellows will appreciate this comment. I will hand over to Diaka, my colleague, to rip apart uh, our audience. <laughs> rumble, rumble. Oh. <laughs> so um, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I list these countries, Croatia, Spain, Greece, Bulgaria, what comes to mind? Oh, beautiful countries, beautiful vacation spot, beautiful restaurant, beautiful beaches. And when I talk about Rwanda, what some of the things that will come to mind, oh, dictator, oh, human rights violation. 
It's all about narrative. That's the narrative that Western media feeds us. Because when, you, when we look at, uh, according to the Transparency International uh, 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 ranking, Rwanda, when it comes to corruption, is ranked better than Croatia, Spain, and Greece. But then again, when we talk about Rwanda from a Western point of view, it's, oh my God, the dictator, the this and that, because, but we're not gonna talk about the things that he's done well, for instance, corruption. But when we talk about this Western country- One more minute. It's all about uh, uh, how great they are, how wonderful they are, how we should all vacation there. So it's all about narrative. And I think <laughs> Donald Trump has shown how one of the most powerful countries in the world, America, is also the most corrupt. Because I think he's the only sitting president we got on a phone call talking to another president about quick poco. But we are here talking about African leadership in order, for be, in order for someone to be corrupted, there has to be someone to do, who does the corruption. And since the, the, the beginning of time, the Westerners has always corrupted African leadership. When we talk about slavery, we like to remind, oh yeah, African people sold African people, but to whom did we sell African people? To white people <laughs> who came with bribes and trinkets. So again, it's all about Nar uh, 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 narration. When we talk about wars, look at the war of uh, uh, U.S. Times up, but I'll give you 30, 30 more you. seconds. Look, okay, forget it. Putin. <laughs> Putin sits with these people at the same table as them. Putin wealth is valued at one trillion dollars. How can a head of state has a personal wealth of one trillion dollar? But did they call him corrupt? No, they cannot because he's sitting with them at the same table. If he's corrupt, it means they are corrupt as well. So we talk about Ukraine, him invading Ukraine. It's all about corruption, manipulation. But imagine Rwanda invades Congo. You will see hellfire rain down on them. But no, for Russia, we have to talk. He did, did okay. this, what he did was wrong. <laughs> sanction this, sanction that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's let's get them. Let's give both positions a hand. Let's get them all. This has probably been the most impassioned debate we've had so far, and I suspect that they're going to be in even more impassioned positions. So, I'm going to ask both groups a question, and the question is: So, I'm an academic, and I'm always interested in evidence, 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 evidence. Um, a lot of people, when they talk about corruption, they always reference the CPI, the Transparency International. Corruption's Perception Index. But I'll have you know that the CPI is incredibly problematic because it doesn't measure corruption. It measures perceptions of corruption. There is an actual financial secrecy index that is more robustly evidence-based. And this, was com this came up from the Tax Justice Network, a network that's based across the continent of Africa as well as in Europe. And what they've been able to measure in this particular financial secrecy index, an actual metric for measuring corruption, is the amount of illicit financial flows that leave different parts of the globe. So Africa loses $60 billion a year. This was a, a number that the UN Economic Commission for Africa came up with based on this financial secrecy index. So my question for you is, if we don't actually have evidence, right, if we don't actually have a metric that can measure corruption, then is this debate futile? So that question, if you can use that question to then solidify your point or your position, then I would be very grateful. Who would you like to start? Anyone can start. I can start. Go for it, safe. Okay, so in the famous word of Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> You're back. I'm, I'm not an academic, I'm a practitioner. Of course, he didn't say that. He said, I'm, They're not mutually exclusive. Yes. <laughs> he said, I'm not a politician, I'm a statesman, but you got the drill. Um, I'm definitely aware of the fact that uh, CPI is, is only about perception, and there's a famous story about Brazilians after the Lula da Silva era have sharing a perception that corruption has increased a lot, even though it was actually less because they actually uncovered uh, that kind of corruption. But I insistently chose perception of corruption because I'm talking about citizens. Uh, and I had to make a point that uh, our perception also matters a lot. With all due respect to academics, um, do I really need to say that? Okay. Uh, with all due respect to academics, it's important to take both uh, points into consideration. So six, 
was it six billion or six trillion dollars? Sixty billion. Sixty billion dollars coming out of, of Africa. It could be used as an argument that the other parts of the world are being more corrupt, but who's actually allowing this money to get out of the continent? It's Africans. There are African leaders and pockets of corruption all over the continent that actually allow for this illicit financing to happen. So I think it actually reinforces the argument that corruption is happening right, left, and center. We've been deprived of extremely important, important resources. And we talk about DRC. There's a gentleman that talked about DRC all the time. Dana talks about DRC all the time. It's a country that has been deprived right, left, and center of its rights uh, throughout history. Um, can I take 10 more seconds? 10 more seconds. OK. Um, our friends there are just using confirmation bias. We have, how many countries do we have now around the world? 202, maybe. So just throwing five, uh, the names of five countries uh, that are completely incoherent, irrelevant, um, and, and, and the, the name of a very famous uh, dictator and an and idiot that you all know about <laughs> doesn't really reinforce the argument that, again, we're we don't want blatant generalizations. We want to talk evidence, and we want to talk reality. And I think we're only stating the obvious that Africa is a corrupt continent and that we're all suffering from that. Okay, thank you. Um, in defense of academics, I will say, this is important to BC, right? I will say that evidence is incredibly important and research is incredibly important because it's supposed to feed into the policy making that addresses the scourge of corruption. So I'll just I can never there. disagree with that. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, Diaka and Dalumizi. Again, what Saib did there, it's controlled the narrative, therefore controlling the story. It's all about perception. She's talking about a secret. I'm, I'm a, I'm a financial secret. Okay, why is it secret? So first of all, and I mean, why isn't it published for the whole world to see? Again, it's all about the narrative. As long as the, 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 the Western world feeds us this story that we are the corrupt countries, we are the third world countries, we are the, 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 the countries where war, hunger, disease, and famine is happening, they are able to control our stories. They are able to position themselves as the saviors. Oh, we need to save these Africans. They are so corrupt. They talk, let's talk about mining. For instance, Guinea is a country that has bauxite, that has everything. One of the biggest scandal was with Benny Steimer, who uh, you guys know, billionaire Israeli who is into mining, who was accused of corruption because he bought two blocks worth $4 billion for $160 million. So who is doing the corruption? You come into our countries, you, 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 you bribe the weak-minded people, and then you are the first people that sit there and say, oh my God, you guys are so corrupted. 30 more seconds. So, I mean, it's all about perception. It's all about narrative. They don't care about the numbers. The numbers don't work for them because if the number worked for them, Rwanda Kagame would not be seen as a dictator, but as someone who actually developed an African country. But that doesn't fit the narrative because African countries cannot be developed. African countries must stay corrupt. Thank you. Are we are allowed to respond hey, to that. So I'm going to have to open it up for a question and answer, but you can always come back. Okay. In terms of responding to the question and answer. Let me see, how many hands do we have up? So I see two, two hands. Okay, so we'll start on the right and then on the left. Jonathan. Where's the other hand? Oh, where's the other hand? Where? Wait, Jonathan, okay, I know. okay. Yeah. But I said one, two, three. Go ahead. We can't hear you. OK, yeah. Um, I think I'm listening to this debate, and it's quite interesting. But at the same time, I'm like, I feel like both people are stuck into the idea of like perception in the West. The reality is like Africa is corrupt. Like, why is that an issue? Every country in the world is. So why is it that like we're trying to argue on like how to prove to the West that we're not corrupt or something like that. Like in the US. So is that your question? Why are we question, trying to? Yeah, mm -hmm. my question is like, why do we never talk about the fact that it's like, yeah, like lobbying is allowed in the UK, it's allowed in the US. They call it lobbying and they call it like 
kind of corruption in our continent. But like, why is it that the entire argument around corruption is always centered around the rest rather than okay. Okay, we centering got it. on the incentives mm -hmm. and like the people actually in Africa which are affected by okay. why So why, why, why focus on the perception of the West and not necessarily on how corruption is affecting people in the continent? Thank you for your question. Next question. Oh, <laughs> hi. My question is, why does the world focus on Africa and corruption? Because if you think about it, the whole world is corrupted. So, um, um, so, so does um, the world, um, is the world only focused on Africa because they know Africa has more potential and they're trying to get it in tip top shape so that Africa can support the rest of the world? Thank you very, very much for that question. And we'll take the last question up there and I'll start with you because I think you wanted to respond. I think I'm going to have to give you complimentary copies of my anti-corruption children's books. I'll find you afterwards. Yeah. So um, I have two questions if you allow me to ask them. If they're quick. Very quick. Um, so first of all, to the two gentlemen on the right, um, my question is, how exactly do Africa kick out this corruption? Because we've seen political movements in the past, um, notably at Lumumba, and he got assassinated. And we've seen a lot of um, attempts, especially by Libya, to use the gold dinar to try and kick out Western powers. But due to that, there have been a lot of assassinations due to this. And this is why there haven't been a lot of political movements. So how exactly can you kick out corruption of Africa in the modern day if there aren't any more revolutionary movements? And your and second question? To the left. Um, how exactly do we change the, the narrative on Africa? Because let's be honest, Africa doesn't have a very, very strong uh, media control because the biggest people are BBC, CNN, and Al Jazeera, which none of them are in Africa. So how exactly do you remove these rose-tinted glasses that we have on Africa, that we rose-tinted glasses that we have on the global north? Okay, great. I think a lot of the questions revolve around the idea of re reality versus perception. So um, safe and... Boniface, I think Boniface, you wanted to say something in response. So can you do that in 30 seconds and then answer yeah. the questions that have been directed towards I you? I think actually when you talk about Kagame and Rwanda, it's just one example. And he's actually a darling of the West. What he does is approved by the West. It's actually Africans in Rwanda and in the region like Congo calling him a dictator. But beyond the continent, he's actually a darling of the West. Thank you. That's your perception. But, but, but can I respond to that? How many minutes do you have? You have a minute each to respond, if that's all right. Okay, uh, for Jonathan's uh, question, uh, why are we focus on Africa? Because we're African um, and we're, we're in Africa. Um, I think, I think it, the perception of the West doesn't matter, that I fully agree that it's a narrative that we don't want. But what I agree with is giving an opportunity for people like you, Jonathan, to grow in a world and to grow in a continent where they don't feel like others are having access to opportunities that they are not entitled to. How to, how to kick out uh, corruption? Uh, big, big question, definitely not in 30 seconds. But I think we have a lot of examples in the global south uh, where we can, uh, again, system, syst systemic change is beyond us, as, at least as of now. But there are practices like uh, paid a bribe to come in India, like. Uh, uh, there's so, so much to, to actually uh, mention as examples, sure. Uh, but I think grassroots movements can be the answer. I spent my career uh, on education and I think building and breeding a generation of leaders who do not accept uh, misuse of power is a starting point that may not be rooted in evidence in terms of systemic design, but can at least create the pockets of hope that I spoke earlier about. I think seconds into coaching. That was the only <laughs> I'll come back to you. Let's let's go to um, Diaka and Dalmuzi. So um, so she asked a question. And I think it's a, an important one that we need to address: is why do we focus on the perception and not necessarily how, uh, not necessarily on how corruption actually impacts the lives of people on a day to day basis in the continent of Africa? I mean, we do. Our point was our position was there is corruption everywhere. The issue that we have is that we talk about corruption mostly in Africa. We, we don't talk about it in the, in, in the West, which is, which is what we don't agree on. And it's, about, it's a question of, of perception. And again, it is important to fight corruption because corruption 
uh, uh, hinders the development of, of our country. We are not disputing the fact that there is corruption in Africa. We're just disputing the fact, why is it that, like Jonathan said, why is it about Africa? Why are we focusing on Africa? Why it, it, all the problems, everything that goes wrong is Africa? And to answer that question, Jonathan, is because Africa is the prize. So again, whomever controls the narrative controls the story. And to tie in whatever the gentleman was asking in the back, in order to change the narrative, we need to control our own stories. We need more African media. We need more African voices to tell the stories of Africa. I always like to say, tell the stories by Africans, for Africans first, and for the rest of the world. And that is the only way we can tell our story in a truth, truthful and authentic way, meaning yes, there is corruption in Africa. Yes, we need to fight corruption in Africa, but that does not give you the right to sit there and judge us when you actively participate in that corruption, when you actively participate in eroding our systems, our democracy and our own development 30 seconds. to fit the narrative of your story. Dalamizi, you have 30 seconds if you want to add anything. So just a few things to add is one, um, you know, there's something liberating when perception is corrected to say, actually, they're not as corrupt. We're not saying, you know, because then it's like, wait, what? All along we've been lied to that we're more corrupt. And then you can actually realize, I got work to do. And, you know, the more work I do, the less corrupt I am relative to the next. The second um, is to say, you know, they're, you know, they sort of like the Pandora, the, Panama Papers, the Pandora Papers um, that are coming out, um, you know, which are really beginning to show how corrupt the rest of the world is. More recently, there's the Uber files that have come up, um, and that's really driven by a particular organization called the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Um, so we need more of such platforms that basically really go into the sort of the, the, the institutions and the systems that fuel corruption in this part of the world and have that exposed. Okay, I hope your questions were answered. I think we have to come to a close now. Boniface, you have the last word, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> so one of the things you must address is that African leaders learned to be corrupt from the West and they have been able to perfect that art and they're very corrupt but they can't be corrupted out of the West. Uh, they, we use the SWIFT code to do illicit financial flows. The number is $8 billion, not $66 billion. Uh, we have never, Jonathan is from Ghana, nine years old. A doubt, he has ever eaten Nigerian. Oh, okay. Uh, he's from Nigeria where you have oil, but no electricity. And so <laughs> it's a shame. 20 seconds. Uh, please allow me just a minute. It's a very important <laughs> conversation. Yeah, but please. you need to wrap it up because we do have to vote and drinks head for wine. drinks. Now, that is from France. Listen, um, the problem we have as a continent, we justify bad behavior. We glorify bad leaders who loot our countries. Uh, women die while giving birth. We have no schools. The reason we say Africa is more corrupt because we die more of preventable diseases. The reason why Africa prays more than the rest of the world because when you get cancer, your medicine is prayers. When you get into a road accident, the nearest hospital is prayers. So the thing is, Africa is corrupt. We have learned from the West, but you can fix the continent, but you can't fix it if our friends come and say, hey, you're corrupt as the rest of the world. No, we are not. We are more corrupt than the rest of the world and it can be fixed. And I believe we have a role to play. The guys who are here, we have a role to play. Every single person. Let's fix our continent, starting with the academics. <laughs> Come back home. Come back okay, home. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give them. Let's give both positions a hand. A round of applause. It seems to me that maybe one of the solutions is having a values revolution from below, right? So completely changing our value systems across the continent. But without further ado, let's vote. So how many people say that they're more convinced by Diaka and Dalmuzi? Let's see a show of hands. Okay, the position is that African leaders are no more corrupt than leaders across the globe. It's the perception of corruption in Africa that is the problem. So Dalmuzi and Diaka, how many people are convinced by their arguments? <laughs> okay, great. How many people are convinced by the arguments made by Boniface and SAFE that corruption is the biggest problem with leadership in Africa in both the private as well as the public sector? Okay, so it might... <laughs> What is your name, young man? 
Jonathan. Jonathan, who do you think was more convincing? Do you think both of them, both positions were convincing? Thank you very much. So he decides. Both positions are convincing. Thank you so much to the two panelists or the four panelists for um, a really impassioned appeal. Um, I think this ends the, the debate. Thank you so much again for your attention. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>